Welcome to the Crimson Engine. My name is Rubidium. Today we are looking at day two of the feature film. We're going to be shooting an interrogation scene in a photo studio that's meant to be a police station. And then we're going to be shooting a green screen car scene. The reason that we wanted to do these both on the same day is that they both require the same actor and rather than get him back to do a second day or a third day, if we put them both on the same day, then we only need to pay him for one day. There are a lot of things like this in a schedule that mean you end up shooting out of order, but end up um, saving the production money and actually saving the, you know, the actors a lot of time rather than getting someone in and costume and wardrobe and makeup uh, for like five minutes and then having him come back the next day for the same thing. You want to put all of their scenes on the same day so they can get into character, stay in character and give a better performance. We had originally planned to shoot our interrogation scene on a set that we ended up shooting uh, a lot of other things on, but we realized that the standing sets that we rented for the day had three other locations that we couldn't really find anywhere else. And an interrogation room is just a white room with a mirror on the wall, two chairs and a table. And we could build that somewhere where we had more access and more time and hopefully get a better result rather than trying to cram it into a very busy day. Police interrogation scenes are a staple of thriller movies. In almost every film, the hero or the villain will be in a room with a cop if they're not a cop themselves. And so filmmakers for decades have been trying to work out ways to make this look good, to make this seem interesting. A couple of ones I looked at that were really inspiring were David Fincher's Seven. Uh, they had a really great texture on the wall that made it look really dark and foreboding. Lord of War had an interesting idea where they had this sort of like high fashion set with like a waterfall in the background as the you know, Pentagon interrogation room, which was just wild. It kind of did work actually. American Assassin was this $60 million movie that really just had a tiny room with one Kino flow and a table, uh, which I thought was a weird decision since uh, they could have really gone somewhere with this and ended up you know, making it so basic. The Wire is another favorite of mine. Uh, they do a lot of interrogation interview scenes in this room. And that's where I got the idea for the table with the handcuffs in it or something, at least something that was reflective and not white. Something that would put like a hard pin light in the actor's eyes. So we got a piece of polished aluminum um, that we could put on top of our regular table. You can kind of see that it's not the table in the wide shots, but it doesn't bother me that much did give us a really great texture uh, that we could work with that seemed hard and industrial. This is a pretty long scene. I think it's about six pages. So again, we were looking for ways to light this in an interesting way and to move the camera in an interesting way. For lighting, we went with the Hudson Spider, a single light setup. We basically just had the Hudson Spider red back overhead uh, with a meat ax to block the light from coming forwards. And then, and then Chapin uh, pinned up a piece of duvetine on the outside to keep this from spilling into the rest of the room and keep the walls darker. We could have used the Hudson Spider grid, but decided not to because a grid gives a very distinctive reflection and we didn't want it um, in the eyes of the people or reflecting in the table, which is, you know, metal. We had this big window behind us um, and it was overcast when we started, but then the sun slowly came out and we washed out all our contrast. So when we turned around and shot Derek's single, uh, we put a big mirror that we had on standby, but hadn't actually used up uh, covering the window and then blacked the top out. And that gave us our contrast levels again. We used the Pro-Aim flacking slider for this one uh, to get a slow push in, which was a bit of a challenge for the focus puller. Uh, you know, focus is good at moving in and back, but the very, very slow crawl of focus uh, is difficult because you're needing to like over three or four minutes constantly move the full of focus uh, minutely, but constantly uh, it's difficult to do. So it did take a couple of takes to kind of get up to speed. In my experience, and it was true on the day that there was a couple of different ways the actors wanted to try it, uh, which we did in the wides. And then once we found something that worked for everyone, we sort of settled on that. And then they were able to replicate it uh, in the close-ups. Derek went much more improvisational. Uh, he got some really great lines out uh, 
and he does an amazing job of making the scene feel really authentic, making it seem as though it's not just procedural, like one guy taking other guy's statements. There's real, there's a real spark there that keeps keeps the scene interesting, which is easier said than done after you've done this 15 times to, to keep finding things um, that seem alive in the scene and make and not have the words kind of come out uh, with no meaning. Our last little setup here was getting Connor out of the room. Um, we tried a few different angles. The, we found one that worked. And then uh, we, we weren't allowed to see outside because it's not a police station. It's just, uh, you know, someone's backyard. So we ended up using a, I think, a park hand, Tungsten park hand, and then just uh, angled the camera perfectly so that when he opened the door, we never we wouldn't quite see what's coming outside. It would just be light. This was one of the first scenes I cut together. I think I did it the week after. And this is when I knew that we had something because uh, – it was really fun to watch. Usually when you spend a whole day shooting something, you gotta go back and look at the rushes and start cutting this together. And you just like, it, it can be painful sometimes because you're just so sick of it uh, after you've heard it, you know, 30 times. But I felt like a kid on Christmas day to open up this footage and, and start playing with it, start cutting it together, start seeing the performances. So that for me was a really good indication that we were at least on the right path. Second half of the day was supposed to be in my driveway uh, in the cars that we had got for the production, but it ended up raining like crazy. So I knocked on my neighbor's door and we used his carport, his undercover carport to shoot, uh, which was awesome. We set up a cloth screen screen. It was kind of getting wet, but we we're able to light it with uh, six foot quasars again. And then we used the ambient and used the cream sauce space X as our backfill to kind of give this pop of daylight um, and uh, through the back window and really edge out the characters. SpaceX is a 1200 watt uh, RGBW LED uh, that is crazy powerful, but still plugs into the wall. It handles weather really well. And we did a kind of gag with it where we had the first AD wave his arm across it. So it seemed like they were going in and out of traffic it just made the footage seem much more alive and not quite so green screen. Shooting in cars is always hard, uh, especially with tinted windows because they suck up so much light. You need a lot of light um, where you start to try and get it into the car and light the characters uh, effectively. I chose to have the scene take place in the back seat because we have quite a few other scenes that are front seat scenes, um, one of which we shot uh, with French overs. Uh, so we put the camera in the back shot uh, shooting over people's shoulders. For this one, I wanted to uh, change it up a little bit. So we shot through the window with Darren, our sound guy, um, booming in from the front seat. I guess we were unlucky that it rained, but lucky that they kind of kept everything to a minimum. Uh, we were able to get the whole, pretty much the whole scene, another four or five pages of this um, exposition. Uh, and it still felt really great. And, you know, Derek did another, you know, changed up his character a little bit, uh, played good cop instead of bad cop and was able to uh, keep, try and keep um, Connor, our lead, on his toes. We did think about kind of bumping the car a little bit to give some motion. So after shooting like two pages on our first day, we got through almost 10 on our second day, put us really solidly on the ground as far as getting the movie shot. It was also good because it was continuous uh, with the day before, with Monday. So uh, we we're able to kind of keep Connor in his zone. Um, he was able to sort of use what we had done yesterday to inform the character and the scene uh, in the second day. That is our look at day two. Please leave your questions in the comments and subscribe if you want to see more of these. Uh, we have five more days to go on this first session. We're on hiatus right now. Once we can go back to shooting it, uh, we have 10 more days of that. Thank you very much for watching. I will see you next time.